What I think is in the early plays, Shakespeare doesn't know women very well. And you can see it most clearly in Taming of the Shrew or Comedy of Errors. You know, there's the, there's the terrible shrew that's got to be tamed. And then there's the sweet little sister, like Luciana in Comedy of Errors. And she, she says, um, uh, and th this is, Luciana was, it was based on a Roman play, but Luciana Shakespeare invented. And this is her longest speech in the play. She says to her sister, who's screaming and yelling because her husband's out in the street having it off with another woman, and she's saying, well, headstrong liberty is lashed with woe. There's nothing situate under heaven's eye but hath his bound in earth, in sea, in sky. The birds, the fishes, and the winged fowls are their male subjects and at their controls. Man, more divine, the master of all these, lord of the wide world and wide watery seas, endued with intellectual sense and souls of more preeminence than fish and fowls, are masters to their females and their lords. Then let your will attend on their accords. So there you have it, you see. You not only have man is master of everything, and we can see where that's got us with global warming, uh, but you also can see how, how endued this idea is of, of women have to behave and do what the man wants, and that's the only way to be calm and sweet. And so you see this Shakespeare who actually believes that. I do think he actually believes that, or he's writing it without thinking it. Then you suddenly get from there, there's two years where the playhouses are closed because the plague is there. He's out on the road some, but then people don't want to hire the actors either because they think they're bringing the plague with them. So it's a really rough two years. At the end of that two years, he writes Romeo and Juliet. So you go from these sweet little things into this woman who is as sexually desirous as Romeo is, who is as brave as he is, who opposes her father, who is willing to take drugs to make it look as if she's dead, and then when she discovers Romeo's dead, will kill herself. An incredible picture of female passion, of commitment to an idea, uh, the idea of unity in love, and this sexual spiritual merging. Because they keep on calling each other their spiritual, their spiritual hearts. So how do you get from this silly Luciana, oh, we got to do what men tell us to do, into this woman, Juliet, uh, who got equal billing? you know, is there. Well, my answer is, is that in that two years, Shakespeare fell in love. And when he was not on the road, he was creating an academy with all many other intellectuals of the age, which was based on the academy Philip Sidney had, who was their great hero, who got killed in Zutphen. And they, it really, it came out of the, the French academies which then in Love's Labour's Lost, Shakespeare writes about it. And he almost gets there in Love's Labour's Lost about men and women being equal. Um, but, not, but he doesn't embody them. He doesn't write it from the inside. He's still projecting onto women and writing them from the outside. So I think he falls in love. But who does he fall in love with? And I join with a lot of other people who are honing in on Amelia Bassano. And she was a Venetian, a Venetian Jewish, actually North African descent first. Um, the family went from North Africa, where they kept silk farms, up to Bassanio, down into Venice, where they became the leaders of St. Mark's Orchestra. So they're Christianized Jews by this time. Henry VIII brings five brothers over, so the whole family, to create his orchestra. And she is the daughter of the youngest of those and comes from a very musical family and is herself a, a good musician. But then she also becomes the first published woman poet of the time. She's a real feminist. And uh, she says, for God's sake, church, stop blaming us for, for Eve's sin, 
even if he did sin, it, she was only trying, she didn't know what the consequences were, Adam did, she was trying to please him, and in any case, you don't come into this world without our pain, so shut up. <laughs> I mean, I love her, I love her, she's, but she's obviously far too noisy and raucous to, um, uh, to but she does draw attention, and the, and the Countess of Pembroke, I think was creating these circles. She's Philip Sidney's sister, and Shakespeare was a member of the Earl of Pembroke's uh, troop by this time. So there's a, I pull a lot of these stitches together. But once he started writing women from the inside, not the outside, there's no stopping him. He never goes back. He never projects up, upon women. It's not that he doesn't comment on how other people say women should be, but he never goes back, never ever goes back from, from his position. And really, by the time he gets to the end of his life, he's saying, look guys, if you don't do what women say we should be doing, if we don't get in touch with our own feminine side and creative sides, because he says creativity, we're never going to get out of this mass of killing and killing and revenge killing and revenge killing. There's no way out unless we actually bring what are known as feminine attributes, but of course both men and women have them. But unless we strengthen those, we're never going to get out of this, this map of violence. And so in the late plays, the daughters redeem the fathers. There's always a sin at the top of the play. And, but then a few good women and one good man has to stand with them in order to turn it around.